computer. Okay, I'm going to record this one on the computer. I'm going to upload it then to YouTube. Um, I think this will have a little bit more, this morning have a little bit more universal um, appeal. So yeah. we, uh, we, we looked at the Haggadah. Let's review the questions. Now we're going to start to uh, answer them. But let's review our questions in the Haggadah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I think we had uh, it was like at least a dozen questions, something like that, right? And probably more, probably more. Um, so when we start off, well, uh, Magid, Magid starts out on page uh, twenty-four. Uh, there's the Halachmania, then Manishtana. Okay, Halachmania followed by Manishtana. So Manishtana, the uh, we we will presume, and as a matter of fact, and this is uh, this is not such a strange presumption, but we will presume that this answer follows the questions of Manishtana. So Manishtana, what's going on here? The kid asks four questions, and at the end of Manishtana, we say, "Well, here's the answer. It sounds like." As a matter of fact, I'll take it even a step further. My grandfather, like many, many, many Jews used to always preface, before he said the words, Avanim Hayinu, he would always say in Yiddish, the Teretz says, the answer is, and then he said, Avanim Hayinu. So, then this must be the answer, right? This is the story, supposedly. If that, taking that assumption, which we're going to, we're going to reject that assumption, but if you take that assumption as true, okay, you know, I mean, I hate to do this to my grandfather, but, you know, I, I presume that Zeta was doing this because that's what his father did. And that's what his father did. OK, so the Malbim is going to take a different approach here. But if we start off with the assumption that this is the beginning of the answer, so we have the following questions. It starts off with Avodim Hayinu Leparo B'Mitzrayim. So, one of the first things we said is, if this is the answer, it seems out of order because... What? Yeah, in answer to Manishtana. The Manishtana is what's going on here tonight? Why are we doing this? And then the answer would seem to be, well, because of Adim Hayinu and, and Allah, you know, everything from there and on. Okay? However... The problem is, the problem is, if we turn ahead to page 30, you know, so over there it says, Mitchila Odazara. Okay. Originally, we were Ovdea Vodazara. So, um, which is, going back even before Avadim Hayinu. And as a matter of fact, at the end of that paragraph, Mitchila Ovdei Avodazara Hayu Avoseinu, it says in the end, Vatein Yisrak as Yaakov, Ves Esav, Vatein Esav as Har Seir, Loresh as Oso, the Yaakov Avon of Yerdu Misraima. At that point, I would have thought the next paragraph should be Avadim Hayinu. Because it says, V'yakov v'vanav yordu Mitzrayim. The next thing is, Avadim ha'yinu l'parav Mitzrayim. But it's not the way it is, right? What is this doing back here? Okay. Now, that's one thing. Another problem that we had with this, Avadim ha'yinu l'parav Mitzrayim, is it seems to say, it says, V'yilu l'hotzi ha'kodesh baruch hu. We would still be in Mitzrayim, even today. Now, of course, you know, they say, well, who would have thought that Paro would have lasted for so many centuries? And the answer is, even if he didn't, but whoever would have taken over would have taken us as slaves. We just would have been slaves to the next one and the next one and the next one. Maybe not to Paro, but to any of his successors. It would be all the same. Yeah. They would just, <laughs> yeah, right. They would just pass us off as, as you know, the loot, 
you know, that when they knocked off, whoever knocked him off, we would have been slaves to that guy. Then whoever would have knocked him off, we would have been slaves to that guy. And it just would have gone on and on and on. The problem with that is this seems to be saying that the Tzias Mitzrayim directly impacts me today, here, now. Great idea. The issue with that is, turning ahead again, page 44 this time. You look at the bottom of 44. Bechol dar vador. Ayavadam liras is asma ki lehu yasam yitzrayim. Well, that's the same idea. Mm-hmm. Right? That's that's the same idea. You just told me. I mean, harei anu vanena mishubadim hain laparal b'mitzrayim. We will be slaves to power. And we're supposed to view ourselves as though we personally went. I mean, that's the same thing. So why are you repeating this idea again later on? Okay? That's another question that we ask. Um, then we ask a series of questions because everything after those first two opening sentences does not seem to make sense. I'm all primed to hear the story. I'm getting ready. Got my kid. He's all pumped up. He asked the four questions. Yeah, okay. Tell me about this. How's it going? What's happening? What happened? How did we become Avadim Leparal Mitzrayim? What was it like to be Avadim Leparal Mitzrayim? And instead, what do I hear about? A few Kalana Chachamim, Kalana Nevonim, Kalana, you know, Yodi Mesatara. What's that got to do with anything? What do you mean? Huh? I'm paid back to page 26. Back to Avarim Hayinu. Okay? So on page 26, in that middle paragraph there, if we go on, we started the first two sentences sounded like we're starting the story. However, as we continue... Um, we get, we we seem to totally abandon the story, and it tells you even if we're chachamim and nevonim and everything like that, we have to tell over nevonim zakenim. We have to tell over the story. Okay, and that does that seems to be like off topic, and then it goes even more. We have the story of these chachamim that were in Bnei Brak. It also doesn't seem to do much for us about Yitzias Mitzrayim at all. And then we go even a step further, where Rabbi Lisbon Azariah seems to be telling us that we should, uh, he tried to get, he tried to have instituted that we should remember Yitzhak Mitzrayim every evening of the year. And he was unsuccessful until Ben Zoma came along. Great. That's so nice. Who cares? What does that have to do with with Pesach, with the story? You know, I mean, it's completely, not only is it not telling the story, it doesn't even have to do with Pesach. It's a it's a halacha of all year long. The saying, remembering, it's yes, Mitzrayim, we add a third paragraph to Shema every night. That's great. I mean, learn that in the halacha class. You know, you got a halacha class, the laws of Shema, you say the first two paragraphs, and then you add on about Yitzhak Mitzrayim. But it has nothing to do with the story. Then we have the four sons, which still are not telling us the story. However, the four sons talk about passing it on to our children. And then, to top it all off, we get to the top of page 30. And on the top of page 30, we have another one of these paragraphs that has nothing to do with the story, but just telling us when it is that we're supposed to uh, have the Seder, do the Haggadah. Okay, so all of that is very curious. What are these paragraphs doing there? And to top it off, um, let's turn to page 42, page 42 at the bottom of the page, along comes Rabban Gamliel. 
And Rabbi Gamliel says, if you don't say these three things, you did not fulfill your obligation, Pesach, Matzah, Mora. And then there's a paragraph that tells you why, from where do we know that you have to mention Pesach? From where do we know that you have to mention Matzah? And from where do we know that you have to mention Mora? The problem with those three is, if those are essential components of telling over the story, how come it wasn't until page 42 that they showed up? Because to tell you the truth, it's the end of the story. Because there's only one more paragraph of the story left, which is the bottom paragraph of page 44, and then we're into Hallel. The, the bottom paragraph on 44, which we've already mentioned, we don't know exactly like why that was there, because that idea was mentioned earlier. But at this late point in the Seder, you're talking about you're talking about the three essential components. I would have thought that perhaps at the very, very beginning, before you get started, you quote Rabbi Gamliel. And you say, okay, now you're about to tell the story. Be sure you mention these three components, because if you don't mention these three components, you're out of business. You start there at the beginning. Don't tell me that at the end. Okay. So that's pretty much. So our objection really is with the order of the paragraphs, not with right. what the paragraphs say. Right. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. But also, the paragraph, it should have actually prefaced the story. And remember, if we're like Maizeda, who said, the Teretz is, then the story has already started. So according to that approach, which I think if you would ask the average person, they would tell you the story starts with Avadim Hayinu, then why is all this stuff, a lot of this stuff should have been mentioned beforehand, and certainly of all the things that should have been mentioned beforehand would be Rabbi Gamliel. Because Rabbi Gamliel says, if you don't say these three things, you haven't even done the mitzvah. These are like so essential. Yeah. I mean, listen, if I don't know how to explain it to the simple son, okay, you know, I mean, I'll figure it out, right? But Rabbi Gamliel is saying, these are absolute requirements. I would have thought, before you start telling me the story, you should have told me these three things are requirements. But certainly, don't wait till the very end of the story when it's all completed to tell me the three requirements. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, by the way, you know, you just totally blew it. <laughs> you know, why did you tell so, me now? So Robin Gamil should have been up with uh, Mitzvah Alein. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would have thought it would be somewhere there. Maybe even, maybe even I would have put Rabbi Gamliel before Avonim Hayinu. I mean, somewhere, you know, or at the very least. Yeah, Mitzvah Lein al right. Don't you know the story before I need to know what the mitzvahs are within the night? I'm presuming if I'm telling my child that he may not know the story. Yeah, that is true. He doesn't know the story. We hope he doesn't. So if I start out with, and you have to do X, Y, and Z, he's going to say, well, why do I need to do Well, maybe that's the point. Yeah, he doesn't know the story, but you know the story. So you, who are about to tell the story, before you start to tell the story, you know, like, like this would be like, um, you know, um, like we're talking on air of Pesach, you know, and I would say to you, uh, you got the Seder? Yeah, I got Seder. I got the grandkids coming, you know, so I'd say to you, like, remember, be sure you be sure you explain Pesach Matz and Mara, right? Be sure you do that, right? Whatever you're gonna do, you know, and I know you're gonna do your whole say. Be sure you get in those three components. I mean, it's that's you say before you even get started. Just remember, because that's essential. You know, probably most intended at the beginning. Yeah. Well, you know, if this is rubbing them, Leo. Rebbe Gamliel doesn't uh, actually. It's Rebbe Gamliel seems to say not what Moror is. Well, he says he really the, these three paragraphs seem to prove um, 
that you were obligated to say it. Like, you know, say, Pesach Masr Mor. Okay, I said it. No, I think when it says Moror, I think what it means is you're supposed to delve into the bitterness of the servitude. The the paragraph here is just to show that we're obligated to do that. But I don't think it satisfies having said it. You know, I think you got to dig into it. Yeah, the paragraphs, the three paragraphs that explain Pesach, Matz, and Mora, I believe, are just telling us why, where we know that we're obligated to mention those three things. <clears throat> Because they have these shenemars. Shenemar means this is my proof. My proof text. How do I know I'm supposed to do this? Shenemar. Now that's not really talking about the topic. That's telling me that I'm obligated to talk about the topic. And then the same with Mats and the same with Mora. It's not really, you know, you think you, you, the Matzah could be, Al Shim Shal He Speak with Sekim Shal Vasin Lachmits. That's it? No, you have to explain the whole deal, why they were there, why they were in a hurry, why they, you know, how they left. There's a lot of talking. All that paragraph is telling you is you're obligated. Shenamar, as it says. You know, <clears throat> you, this is telling you that you, you're obligated to, to say it, but, the, you know, you have to dwell on it. Okay, so now, um let's take a look at where in the Torah are we told to uh tell over the story. Where in the Torah are we told to tell over the story? Now, actually, it is kind of um, um convenient for us. We are told in four different places to tell the story. And it just so happens the four different places are quoted in the Haggadah. Where? The four sources to tell the story. Where are they found in the Haggadah itself? <clears throat> Probably when they talk about when he took his hat. Yeah. Um, well, Actually, okay, they are found in the four places of the four sons. Our Chamim oh, yeah, right. ascribed each of the four sources to one of the four sons. So, you know, a quick a, a quick look at page uh, twenty nine. In your Haggadah here, will show the four sources. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, actually, the four sources say um, there's one in Deuteronomy and one in Exodus 12 26, 13 14, and 13.8. So, I guess, let's take out our Chumashim, and we'll take a look at them in their context. We'll see what's going on. Let me get out of that's, that's where, when I saw that, I know that. It's like, yeah, I'm not sure where they actually wanted to put it. Obviously, it's all around them. It's spreading. Right, right, right. It doesn't matter. Okay. Here we go. To the right. You got one already over there. You got one, one for you and one for me. Okay. So let's do them a little bit in reverse order. 
Uh, let's go to the Deuteronomy uh, 6, 20. Devorim, first parshas Vestanan. So, where does it say over there? Yeah, Pazik 620. When your son will ask you tomorrow, saying, What are these testimonies, law, uh, judgment, laws, and judgments that God has commanded you? Pazik 21. And you shall say to your son, We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. Okay. Yeah, that's our opening sense in the Haggadah. So that's a question and an answer, and, and that you're supposed to tell your son. Tell your son. Okay, that's one. Let's go back to chapter 12 in Exodus. Chapter 12 in Exodus. So in chapter 12 in Exodus, let's look at Pasuk 26. And there it said, what is it, 25? Um, or 26. Pasuk 26. And it will be, and it will be, Ki Yomru Aleichem B'neichem. This is Exodus chapter 12, verse 26. Okay. So this is the wicked son. Well, I'm right. So in chapter 12, plus 26, it says, And it will be when your son will say to you, What is this service to you? And you say to him, That when he, when he uh, passed over the houses of the Egyptians. That Pesach is going to find its way in when Rav Gamliel says, Why well, you say Pesach? Okay. So that's the second time in the Torah where it tells us what you're supposed to say to your children. Now, um, in the, um, we've got chapter 13. Just turn ahead a little bit to chapter 13. At this time, though, I want to go to 13 plus 14. 13, 14. And it will be when your son will ask you tomorrow, saying, what is this? So you say to him, with a strong hand, did God take me out of Egypt from the house of bondage? And Pharaoh was hard on us to send us, and God killed all the firstborn, and da, da, da. Okay? That's three. Now go back a page to one page, back to Pusik, thir chapter 13, Pusik 8. It says, you should tell your children tomorrow on this day saying, on that, you tell your children on this day saying, because this guy did for me when he took me out of Egypt. Now, if you compare the, uh, if you compare all four of these, which are actually easy to compare without flipping around a lot, if you look in your Haggadah to the four sons, okay, so you look at what is the the what are the comparisons? One of them, the first one, the wise son, he says, "What are the testimonies, decrees, and ordinances?" The wicked son says, "What purpose is this work to you?" The simple son says, "What is this?" The son that's unable to ask. 
you have to tell your son on that day. Okay? So the difference, what's the difference there? What do you notice about those four times? Four times it says in the Torah about telling your children. Mm -hmm. But one of them is different than the others. Yeah. Which one is different than the other three? Well, the simple son, it's the Armarta. And for the son who is unable to ask, it's Higadta. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, let's see, does um does the one you have a Marta, right? We have Martas. So have a Marta and he got it, huh? Okay. Um how about over here? Three, three seem to be about the story, one's about laws. Okay. Three about the story, one is about laws. Okay, the one in Dvarim is all about laws. The other three have been have to do with the story. Yeah, true, true. Um, I think, and three of them say Vamarta. One of them says Vihigadita, Vamarta. Okay. Um, okay, so to uh, to help you out, Three of them are in response to your child saying something. And one of them is not. And the one that's not is characterized in the Haggadah as the son that doesn't know what to ask. He didn't say anything. So you have to talk up. You have to say something. You have to get him started. You have to initiate. The other three, he's initiating. Now, the other three, therefore, if you, the other three, I could say, if my son asks, then this is what I answer. What if my son doesn't ask? What am I saying? Uh, that's the fourth one. Yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't ask. If he doesn't ask, right. If I only had three of them, then I would say that the Torah has answers for children that ask. If your child asks you one of the following three questions, what is this? What is this to you? Or what are these testimonies? And da 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 then these are the appropriate answers for those three. But I would not see anywhere from those three that there is an obligation to initiate a conversation with your child. And I certainly would not see that there's any obligation to initiate a conversation on the holiday of Pesach. Because the other three, by the way, where where do they say? Like, take a look at chapter, um, chapter twelve, plus twenty six. Yeah, and it will be when your sons say to you, uh, what is this service to you? So you should say to him. When is the son saying that? Uh, when you enter the land. Oh, yeah, when you enter the land, yeah. Okay, so well, my family's been living in Israel now for 300 years. So at some point after we enter the land, when is he saying this? Hmm. I was simply saying it at one at Pesach. Why did you assume that? Because it says the Bermar Tems Devak Pesach. It is the slot. Okay. What is this service here? Yeah, so you'd say, okay, I guess that one you would say it's somewhere associated with this service, right? Now, when do you think he really would be saying it? If that's if that's what you're picking up on, so when do you think he's is asking this question? During the service, when you're when he's doing it. When he's doing what? During the service. Yeah, you know when that is. Erev Pesach, Dad, 
Oh. Why are you slaughtering the sheep? Huh? Yeah, I missed that. Right. Not at the Seder. No, you're right. Yeah. Hey, what is this? What are you doing, Dad? And they're sprinkling done. blood and, yeah. you know, what's going on? Right? Not yeah. at the Seder. He's saying, he sees, you know, let's go. We got to get up to the base of Migdash with the sheep. Why? What's going on? And then they're doing this. And wow, everybody's doing this. Why is everyone doing this for? You know? Right? Or, for that matter, let's flip back to Devarim. Flip back to Devarim 6. 620. How about this one? <laughs> You're going to have a harder time with this one. Look at 620. Deuteronomy 620. My yeah. <laughs> When's My that? Tomorrow. You know, like, yeah. At some date in the future, unannounced said, when is that? You know, it's a Tuesday in February or, or you know, uh, up at the lake in, 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 in late July when you're, uh, you know, you know, he says, hey, Dad, tell me about all this Jewish stuff. You know, it's, 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 on a, it's on a summer night in July. I mean, how do you know, right? So, First of all, the three, the three uh, sources that we have here, and the other one is in third back to Exodus thirteen fourteen. Let's just check in on that one. There it goes again. Third Exodus thirteen fourteen. When's your child asking you? I think well, there it goes. <laughs> Tomorrow. 13, 14. Okay. So the three of them, three of them are uh, asking, and three of them, it's ill-defined as to when they're asking, but you figured that one of them might have been asking during the slaughtering of the Pesach. Kind of, you know, it's a good guess. You know, it's a good indicator. Not not crystal clear, but it's kind of an indicator. Okay, there is one, however, in 13.8. Just go back one page. What does that Pesach say? The Higarita Labincha, when? On that day. Okay, uh, and and you should on that day, so that is the mitzvah pasuk. The mitzvah, there is six hundred thirteen mitzvahs in the Torah. One of them is to tell your children to to relate the story of the Exodus from Egypt on the night of Pesach. The source is Exodus thirteen eight. Thirteen eight. Not Exodus uh, 12, 26, not Exodus 13, 14, not Exodus 6, 20. All of those are not mitzvos. All of those are, how do you respond to a child who asks a question? Whenever he asks the question. Machar. At some point in history, your child might ask you questions, and this is what you should say. And then our sages looked at it and they said, ah, you see, I, I see reflected here from the nature of the questions being asked. I see three different types of children and therefore appropriately three different types of answers. And, and when does that take place? Machar. Or maybe on the afternoon before Pesach. But the mitzvah of, but in those three cases, if your child does not ask, you are not obligated to initiate a conversation and impart any history. So that's the answer to the question that we brought up on Tuesday, which is why do we call this a Haggadah? Yeah, as there you go. To the right. That's right. That's right. Because the mitzvah is he got it. Right. You tell him. You know, you know, he wants to hear it. He doesn't want to hear it. Of course, he doesn't want to hear it because. You know why he doesn't want to hear it? It's not that he doesn't want to hear it. It never even crossed his mind. Of course, he's not, you know, like when the kid woke up that day, this kid, 
this this child, you know, that on era Pesach, farthest thing of his mind would be, you know, uh, tell me about the Exodus of Egypt. He didn't know about the Exodus. He didn't know anything. He's for sure doesn't want to know about it. Not that he's like anti or anything. He just, why would he want to know about it? You know, like, you know, um, tell me about the uh, the 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 I think they're called the Punic Wars or something. <laughs> You know, gee, Dad, tell me about the Punic Wars. What? Like, what are you talking about? You know? Yeah. That's a good question. We can say maybe we'll have a little time. We'll we'll darshan it out a bit. Okay, let's put that question up. They could be four sons of one parent. They could be four sons of each other. They could be, who knows? I don't know. Four different families. We'll see. But the mitzvah of Sipur Yitzis Mitzrayim, we're talking about the story of the exodus of Egypt, is the source for that is the Pasuk, Vigarta Levincha, found in Exodus 13, 8. Okay. Okay. So now, let me pop this up on the board here. If you're playing along at home, you can take out a piece of paper and write it. I could actually write it on your screen, but I'm not going to. Okay. The posting says as follows. Okay, so now, so now we have identified that the mitzvah of the Haggadah, of what we're doing tonight, is found in the Pasuk 13, Exodus 13, 8. So, if I'm a rabbi, and I want to help out my congregation, I know my congregation, in just a few short weeks, is going to have a mitzvah to do. Okay? So I want to help them out to do that mitzvah. And I know that it might be a tall order, because I know that there are a number of people in my congregation that it's going to be pretty demanding for them to fulfill this mitzvah properly. They're not studying this all day in and day out. They don't have such a background. They themselves don't know it all that well. They're going to be asked to be teaching it to their children. It's a tall order, right? So I want to help them out. So I'm going to write a book, a manual, you know, distribute this to my congregation, you know, on behalf of the, 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 you know, with a little front thing in there. From a dear, dear congregants, I thought this would help you out. Wishing you a happy and healthy and kosher Passover. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at the Shul office and da 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 da, you know. And on behalf of the entire staff here at Congregation Ariel, we wish you the best of peace. Okay, right? And then I have this little handout that's going to help them get through the thing. And so I write up this handout. These are what I've come up with, and this can help you do it. Where would I, how would I compose that? How would I compose this handout? You know? So with a committee, we've been asked to come together and compose the handout. I've received many requests to the congregation. Oh, Rabbi, I'm really worried. Pesach is coming. I, I know how to clean for, for chametz, but I really do not know how to tell this story over. Could you prepare something for us to help us out? Okay, be glad to do that. What do I do? How do I prepare it? Where, where, you know, what do I do? So where would I start? 
What's the Haggadah? He's right. He's right. Hasn't been written. Been written yet. Written. Yeah. I'm, I want to. I'm going to write it up now. I'm going to write it. <laughs> or I'm going to come up with something. I'm, I'm going to create a packet. Okay. So I'm going to create a packet. Where would I start? With Exodus number eight. I mean Exodus thirteen number eight. Very good. Why am I starting there? Because that's the commandment. There you go. <laughs> Excellent. That's where you go. The first thing you do is let's read the commandment very carefully to find out what we're supposed to do. Okay. So Exodus 13, 8 is ground zero. Okay. That is the commandment. Not the other three. The other three are answers when children ask questions. And they might be useful and helpful, but that's not the commandment. Because the commandment is the Higata, you shall tell Hagada. Whether he wants to hear it or he don't want to, I don't care. Tell it, right? You got to tell it. Okay, so now I'm going to analyze this person. One of the first things that I do when I analyze the person, now it's Chumash class. Now we're, now we're back to Chumash class, right? We're reading this Pusuk and we're going to read it very carefully and we're going to ask ourselves questions. Okay, so there are a number of statements in this. For this purpose, I've got it right up here on the board whether you can see it or not. I don't know if you can see it. But anyway, there it is. There you go. Yeah, good, good, good. Yeah, good. I'll just stand here like this. And hold it. <laughs> you got it in your chumash, okay? So like, here's what. This is saying a number of things. I would like to break this down into phrases so we can analyze it. So let's put in commas. So each... Uh, what they call subordinate clause, I think. It, let's put a comma after each clause. Okay, so where should I put my first comma? After tell. You shall tell. Okay, you should tell. And what else? Next, next, next comma. Mm -hmm. No, I would say hey, your child. Who are you telling? Yeah. You're telling your child. Your right. child. Okay. When, Next. When? On that day. On that day. Mm. I would put, I would say, I would do a comment after saying, saying, uh, saying, okay. Okay. And then because of this comment. Because of this. Okay. What do you say? Any more books? Hashem did for me, comma, me, when I left. Me, when I left. When, when I, or maybe even after I, when I. Mm. When I left Egypt. No, I think when I left Egypt. I mean, maybe I left Egypt because when I, there's no I. It, right. right. This is referring to something, but I is not right. the meaning. Okay. Yeah. So the first one that you have to tell or have to do. And no, it's you. your. It's supposed to be your child. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Okay. So, um, yeah, you should tell your child on that day. Say, because of this, Hashem did for me when I left Egypt. So here's what happened. The Chachamim looked at that person, and they said, "Oh." So, that's the Haggadah. Okay? We have to explain telling, right? Your child on that day saying, word saying, right? I mean, you could have taken out the word saying. You should tell your child on that day because this is Jim DeVue. What's the word saying? <laughs> so, yeah, he's saying it's obvious. It's telling us something. I don't know what it's telling us, but it's telling us something. Right, it's for sure telling us something. We just at this point we don't know what it is because of this. Hashem did for me when I left Egypt. So that's what the Chachamim did. The Chachamim said, "Okay, let's write up a story. Let's write up a, a manual which will um, not check off all those points. You're going to have to 
in this manual, I'm going to have to deal with what is telling, Agada, right? What is telling? Who's your child? Okay. On that day, it's going to have some reference specifically to the day, to the specific to a specific day. What is saying mean? I'm going to have to figure that out, right? Mm -hmm. And then because of this, what does that mean? Who's the this? What's the this? And Hashem did for me, so there's some idea about me. But I'll have to teach it. Okay. And there you have gloriously, I mean really, really gloriously, this whole the whole Haggadah. The whole Haggadah is just laid out, it's right there in that passage. This is this is the Malbim's gift to us that he shows us how the whole Haggadah was laid out very sensibly based on the source text. I mean, after all, if Hashem says to do a mitzvah, you know, we scrutinize every other mitzvah. We learn Gemara all the time. Okay? Like, uh, we're learning about uh, the laws of milk and meat. So, what do we do? Well, it says three times in the Torah, don't cook a kid in his mother's milk. So, we scrutinize those psukim and we derive everything. When you have a mitzvah, whatever the mitzvah is, you scrutinize the, the source text in the Torah and and because you presume if Hashem's telling you to do something, He's telling you you didn't want to, didn't want you wandering around in the dark. If He tells you to do something, He tells you how to do it, right? So read what He said, read it very carefully. Upon careful reading, I came out with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven points. So that means I got to check off. I have to have satisfied all those points. Okay, well, let's see how well our rabbis did with that. Okay, can I ask one question before we go on to that? Yeah. And, and I hope it, it's, it's good. Um, so the next part is about fulfillment. Yeah. So one would say, that <laughs> you were where to fill in at the same yeah but we don't. yeah all right we don't we're filling at the seder right it um because because the higadita has its instructions and the big instruction in there is that the bayamahu and then the next post says well os this story should be a sign on your arm. So your, your arm in between your eyes. You're supposed to wear the story. You're supposed to wear the story. When do you wear the story? Wouldn't you be wearing it at the, at the no, you tell, after you tell the story? When do I wear the story? When do I wear the story? Every time, all the time. There's no restrictions on that. You're only obligated to tell the story uh one time one 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 time a year right one time a year you're obligated to tell the story but you have to wear the story every day yeah right you wear the story you wear the story every day yeah except shop so then they're going to modify that and they're going to say that there are times it says because it it, it specifically says that it doesn't say you should wear the story as much as it says, that the story shall be a sign. I don't dispute that at all. Yeah. If I were a shot guy, yeah. I would say, reading this, hey, I need to wear to fill in the same. This is not yeah. yeah. So the Gemara says, is since it said it should be a sign, we only wear. You don't have to wear a sign when you already have a sign on. So Shabbos, for example, is a sign. So you don't wear tefillin on Shabbos because you don't need to wear a sign when already the Shabbos is a sign. And similarly, I don't need to wear the tefillin when I'm at the Seder because the Seder itself is taking care of it. But if it's not, when you're not busy telling over the story, 
then you do need to be wearing it all the time as a sign. Yeah. Okay. But then we say it three times a day. Shema. You say twice a day, morning and evening, right? So that is right. And that should be a sign. We, we put that paragraph about the exodus of Egypt in our tefillin. It's a sign. And, and all the places where it said it should be a sign in the Torah, we put them in the tefillin, right? And we also do remember the exodus from Egypt. Um, we do remember the exodus from Egypt every day. However, remembering the exodus from Egypt every day, morning and evening, is very different than the Higarita Because to remember the exodus from Egypt, if I get up in the morning and I, you know, say, wow, here I am, you know, driving my car down the street and I'm a free man because God took me out of Egypt. I just took care of it. I could be all by myself in the car. No one's around. Matter of fact, I don't even know if I even have to say it. I just have to think it. You know? Think it, think about, mm, here I am, free man because I'm out of Egypt. I'm all my head. And that night, you know, maybe before I go to bed, you know, I'll put a little note next to my bed, on, you know, on my, on my dresser next to my bed. Remember, you know, only, you, only, you only enjoyed today's freedom because God took you out of Egypt. I read the note. That's great. Go to bed. So our sages formalized it. They said you should say a whole paragraph in the morning and in the evening, you know, you put on your tefillin and all that, you know. But, but technically, I could really satisfy that just by remembering. Now, when it comes to the Haggadah, no, you can't technically satisfy that other than doing exactly what we're going to describe here, because that's the command. And the first thing is vigarto labincha. You know how I satisfy this? <clears throat> I have to do Haggadah to my son. Yeah. yeah, well... Yeah, I guess I guess you could you could uh, say that you're participating in that, you know. And what if you don't? What if you don't have anyone around to say it to, or so don't have any sons? Or you don't have any children. Yeah. So then, what do you do? You're sitting by yourself. You're in your own apartment. Yeah. Or maybe you're like with four other wise men who know the story really, really well. What do you do? Repeat it. Yeah. I, I read about one that the Rabbi Elizabeth and Azaria and Rabbi Tarfon, Rabbi Akiva, they were all, all by themselves in B'nai Brak. So you know what they did? They, they told the story. story. Right? Because you have to tell over the story. You have to tell the story. You're supposed to tell it over to your son. What if you don't have a son? Be Garta. You put the you put the uh, you put the karma up there, right? All I have to do is tell it. Yeah, you put the you you guys put the karma up there. You got to tell it. You got to tell it. Uh, you've got to tell the story. Now, which is actually quite brilliant. If you want to be sure that the children will hear the story. Then what you do is you make a commandment that everybody has to tell it. If everybody has to tell the story, I don't care how wise you are. I don't care how learned you are, how elderly you are. If, if you make a commandment, everybody, bar none, even if everyone is wise and everyone and everyone knows the Torah and everyone, you, everyone has to tell a story. You know what? The kids are going to hear it because every single adult is is obligated to tell it. The kids are going to hear the story. If every single adult is has got to tell it, if you make an obligation, bar none across the board that everybody must tell the story. I don't care if you're B'nai Brock and the other four guys that are with you are very wise. I don't care. Even if you're in solitary confinement, you have to tell over the story, then that will ensure that the children are going to hear the story. 
But if you do it the other way, by the way, if you tell the children, if the obligation is the children, then people who don't have children won't tell the story. People who are wise won't tell the story. People who told the children last year won't tell the story because the kid already knows the story. You know, and on and on and on. And then, you know what's going to happen? Kids are going to start falling through the cracks because people are going to start making assumptions. Oh, my kid already knows the story. I told him last year. You know, before you know it, everyone's going to start having reasons why, you know, why they can't make it this year. You know, can we do it again? Can we do it the next Sunday night? And, you know, all that type of stuff. So, but if you make a universal obligation that everyone should tell the story, then it's going to be told. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, so the obligation is not by the rabbis, it's by the actual what's in the Torah. The Torah. Right. The Torah is the one putting That's the right. Place, That's right. Around. That is right. This is a mitzvah de oraisa. And by the way, you have to always remember this. We, we this is what we spoke about the last thing that I said on Tuesday. Uh, I, let, me, let me start off by reiterating that because it's really important. There are five mitzvahs that we do on the Seder night. Two of them are from the Torah. Three are from the rabbis. The two that are from the Torah eating the matzah. So therefore, a lot of care and concern should be given to eating the matzah and how you eat the matzah. But equally, the other one is telling the story. So it equally requires a lot of care and concern as to how this how this all happens. Those are your two Torah obligations. So it's very, very important. Wine and the moror, the sandwich and the leaning and all that other stuff is all rabbinical. All rabbinical. Four cups. Four cups. Uh, the four cups and the um, and the uh, four cups. The hollow, well, we'll see about the hollow. The four cups and the moror and four cups and more are for sure draw up on in, and which is the other one? Uh, Hallel? Uh, no, not Hallel. Um, is it the Kore? Make a bracha. Make a bracha on the four cups and the and the more are. Those are for sure draw up on in. Hang on. Um, Uh, yeah, a hollow. Okay, I guess so. Hollow is only draw Um, uh, okay, I guess it's draw Okay, we'll see. See what we got. Okay, so now, so now, not only are we going to find that the rabbis based themselves on the pasu and wrote up the Haggadah in, uh, based on what they saw of the mitzvah, not only that, they did it in order. Because if God organized that sentence in that order, so the rabbi said, okay, let's follow that very order. So let's look at the first one, the Gadata Levincha. You shall relate to your child. So, the the first paragraph is not an answer to the story. The first paragraph, and actually the first segment of the Haggadah, tells us about the mitzvah of Vihigadita Levincha. You should tell your son. So now, um, why am I telling my son? So, I'm obligated to tell my son because my obligation to tell my son is because of the fact that we were all slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. And had he not taken us out of there, we still would have been slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. This is explaining to me why I am obligated to tell or to be doing this mitzvah. This is not the mitzvah. Or doing the mitzvah is telling me why I'm obligated to do this mitzvah. This is in distinction 
to the paragraph that's going to say in every generation, everyone has to look at themselves as though they left. And that's a different story. That's actually doing the mitzvah. At this point, we're explaining why we do the mitzvah. Because we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt and he got us out of there. And had he not gotten us out of there, we would still be slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. That's why we have to do this mitzvah. What mitzvah? The mitzvah is called Haggadah. And this mitzvah applies to who? Every single Jew. Every single Jew. This is not a mitzvah that you can fulfill one time or anything like that. It applies to every single Jew, regardless of their background, you know, raid, race, creed, color, national, nation of origin, right? Doesn't matter who you are. Even kulana chachamim, kulana nevonim, kulana zakenim, kulana yodim Torah. Even if we're all wise, understanding elders, and we all know the Torah, mitzvah lenu, the vihigadito levincha, is a mitzvah of us to tell over the sipiyot yitz mitzrayim. And the more you tell it, the more praiseworthy it is. Now, to illustrate that, we have a story of five very, very wise rabbis who were all wise, understanding elders, and they all knew the Torah, and yet they stayed up all night telling it over. And as a matter of fact, they didn't even have any children there. And they stayed up and they told each other the story. How do they do it? All night long. You see from them that when it comes to fulfilling this mitzvah, you got to give it everything you got. And if, if there's still time, that evening to tell more, tell more. They're talking about all the wonders of, of uh, the, the story and delving into details, describing, thinking about, experiencing, trying to like feel what it was all about. So that's why we have the five rabbis there to tell us, even if we're all wise and everything like that, the mitzvah v'garet to applies to everybody. Now, this mitzvah should not be confused with the mitzvah of remembering the exodus from Egypt. We are obligated to remember the exodus from Egypt every morning and every evening, as Ben Zoma tried to get us to believe, in, uh, uh, as, as Rebbe Elizabeth Azari tried to get us to do, but he couldn't do it until Ben Zoma came along. But that mitzvah, don't do that don't do the mitzvah of uh, Pesach Seder night as you would that other mitzvah. The other mitzvah, it just has to be, you know, registered, recognized. You say it, you remember it, that's it. That's all you got, you remember it. Kind of like we remember remember what Amalek did to us, which we just did a few weeks ago. Okay, remember. As soon as I have to check that box once a year to remember. I remember. That's great. But, this is different. This is Higadita. So they're drawing a contrast. Don't think it will suffice by just remembering. No, it's much more involved in Higadita because on the once in the morning and once in the evening, I don't have to say anything, really. I mean, I recite this paragraph in the Torah, but I don't really have to, I don't have to tell anyone. I could say it to myself. I could, I could mumble it along in a low voice. Kiss my tits a few times, and you know, that's great. So, so you're saying the uh, the uh, the uh, Elazar Ben Azariye, we don't want to confuse the mitzvah of the Pesach night, of Pesach night, with the other mitzvah of remembering. right remembering, and that's why Rebbe Elazar Ben is that's here right. to tell us that's not how you do it. That's not how you do it. This is a separate mitzvah, which is not to be confused. With the general mitzvah, there's a mitzvah which says, that actually, you should remember the Exodus of Egypt all the days of your life. And that's why we say it every morning and every right. evening. And at first they said it every morning, then he, he tried to get him to get it to say it every evening. Now we say it every morning, every evening. But yeah, this is a separate mitzvah that's one night a year, which we'll get to in just a minute. But it's one night a year. And that is different than Robles of Azari's thing. 
it has to be said over. Now, by the way, it'll be easy if your son is a Chacham or a Russia or even a Tom. Because in all of the above, they will probably ask some question, which will give you the opening to respond. It might be an antagonistic question. It might be a learned question. It might be a simple question. But, you know, once you have been asked a question, then it's easy. Open. Yeah, exactly. The door is open, you can answer. However, what if the kid doesn't ask? You are still obligated. That is child number four, and that's our pusik. You have to tell. Not for Amarta. When a son and a child asks, then you say. But if the child doesn't ask, then you have to tell. If he got it to, you have to tell. It's forced on him. Now, of course, be smart. Don't be an idiot and, and make it a, um, a, 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 a bitter experience for the kid. But the bottom line is, you got to get this communicated. You know, he got it to us, really. You shall communicate. Now, the Amar does, you say, well, he engaged you in conversation. He said, Dad, what is this? So you say to him, that's, you know, the higanita means this kid's not even thinking about the topic. Mm -hmm. It's not even anywhere on his radar screen. You have to figure out some way to relay the following, communicate to your son the following information. That's the higanita. That's why it's called Haggadah. That's our mitzvah, higanita levincha. And that's why we have the four sons. And the fourth one being the most important one, because the fourth one, he doesn't know how to ask. And that's where we quote the Pusset. So we have been explaining that we are obligated. We're obligated. So I'm obligated. You should tell. I'm obligated to tell. Not as a response, not to answer, but I got to tell. And my child. So that means even if my child doesn't ask, I am obligated to tell that child. They come in different versions, but even the one that doesn't ask, I am obligated to go out of my way and tell them. Okay? Now, when am I obligated to tell them? On that day. Okay? What's the next paragraph on the top of page 30? Yeah. First day of the month. I might have thought. No, no, no. But by the end of the paragraph, what have we proven? Uh, it, it has to be on that day, though. On that day. Yeah. Right. 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 And on that and day, what's that day when they got the months and more in front of us? Yeah. Not the beginning of the month. Okay. No, he says that I might have thought that. I might have thought that. Yeah, but no, that's not. No, nope, that not that's not going to work. Okay. So basically, um, so basically, uh, are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Just cruising right along. And guess what comes next? Saying. I don't get how you get the 15th. I mean, it talks about on that day. Yeah. Well, what day is that? So God it's told us. the first day of the month of Musa. You might have thought that you should start telling this at the first day of the month of Nisan, because that's really when the story began. Because if you're reading in Egypt, God took Moshe outside on the first day of month of Nisan. And he said, uh, you know, this is Rosh Chodesh to you. Tell him to take a sheep. And you know, that's where all the action began. So you might thought that from the, time, that the, from the time of year when the story began, that's when you can do it. But we said, no, no, it's much more specific than that. It's on that day. What day? So on the 15th of Nisan, we were told to take a sheep and slaughter it, put the blood in the doorpost, eat it with matzah. So that day. But the, the sentence goes on to talk about daytime versus nighttime. And then the next it's thing. Not, so then it's like, how do you know that day? So that day 
says the 15th of Nisan. So maybe you know when I should do it? At lunch on the 15th of Nisan. I don't know how you get to the 15th of Nisan. That's what I'm confused. Well, what day are we talking about? What's that day? It's the first day. No, Nisan. I might have thought it should be from the first day, but from the first day of the month of Nisan. Then it could be the first day of the month of Nisan or the second or the third or the fourth or the fifth. It could have been any day of the month of Nisan. You know, with this, it, it, yes. as they say it's in funny. English, it commences with the first day of the month of Nisan. But the Torah says, no, on that day, there's a specific day that I'm supposed to do this. Not just any of the first, any time during the first 15 days of Nisan. On that day. Okay, fine. So it's, what day would that be? The day of the Exodus. The day when God told, you know, the day of the Exodus. That day specifically. Okay, that would make sense. I mean, what other day of the month would be a specific day? What other day of the month of Nisan would be specific? The day of the Exodus is the only day that would be specific. So then I would think you do it at lunch on the 15th of Nisan. That would be a good time. Everyone should get together for a big lunch on the 15th of Nisan. So I said, no, it's going to be because it also says you should tell them on that day because of this. Well, what's the this? There has to be a this there to talk about. The this is, is something tangible. So that must be, when when do I have something tangible? Matzah and Mar. Matzah which the Torah told us you have to do on the evening. So therefore, it must be that when I'm telling the story, it must be when the this, the Matzah and the Mar, are on the table. And the Matzah and Mar are only on the table one night. The night of the 15th of Nisan. And that's <laughs> when I say it. Is that when the exodus actually started? Was at night? Yeah, they actually left at night. So they left. They left in the morning. They were free at night. Technically, that's a, a good question. They actually left first thing in the morning, right? But so they said, "Well, are they leaving the first? So then it should be in first thing in the morning. We should have to say to when they leave at the crack of dawn. You should have to say. <laughs> so, like Rabbi Akiva says, they were actually when when the Egyptians died at midnight. That is, that's when they were really free. Right. Nobody wants to eat lamb for breakfast. Right. And they said, get out. That's when they came running and told them, get out and all that. Right. So, so that <clears throat> they had the Seder. And while they were having their Seder at night, the Egyptians came, Pharaoh said, get out of here and all that stuff. They left in the morning. Okay. So now that paragraph is there because on that day. And so far, we're following an order. What comes right after that? What happens right after we're done with that paragraph? What what happens in the Haggadah next? Yeah. Say, we start telling the story. Okay? We start telling the story. So we start telling the story. And we tell the story from the middle of page 30 all the way till 42. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so say, start saying the story. <laughs> start saying the story. Okay. At this point, now is time. Enough instructions. Now start saying the story. Where's the story? Start me a low once upon a time. We were slave, we were we were idolaters and you know, and the whole thing. Now, how exactly we tell the story, we're not gonna look at. For our purposes right now, we're not going to dwell, delve into that, which we might get back to if we've got time. Okay. But that is saying, you're saying over the story. And that is from, starts on page 30, second paragraph, goes all the way to page 42. Up till Rabbi Gamliel. Up till Rabbi Gamliel. Okay, you're supposed to tell your child on that day, tell your child on that day, say, because of this. Okay, because of this. Now, what's the this? Well, we just talked about it because it was quoted in the paragraph on page 30. What's the this? Mats and Mara. Actually, there's... Pesach, Pesach, Matzimar, because of this. Oh, 
this is what you're supposed to tell your child. That means it's 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 very important to say because of this, because it says that's what you're supposed to be saying because of this. Okay, enter Rabbi Gamliel. Why enter at this point? Because because that's where because of this shows up in this in the source pasuk. Okay, and that's where Rabbi Gamliel comes in, page forty-two and page forty-four. Because of this is Rabbi Gamliel. Okay. That's what Rabbi Gamliel says, because of this. And what's the this? Pesach, Matzah, and Marar. Mm -hmm. so that's because of this. Why do I, why I stick it there? I said, we had this problem. You should have given me that instruction all the way in the beginning. Well, you know why I put it there? Because that's when the Torah puts it there. Yeah, <laughs> the Torah put it there, right? <laughs> I'm not trying to be smarter than Hashem. If that's what he said, to do it. I'm just following the order. So we haven't gone in order. We haven't gone out of order yet. 26, 28, 30, 30, 42, 42, 42. We're just going along, following the order. We're just cruising along, following the order of this thing. Okay. Now, what comes up next? You're supposed to say, because of this, Hashem did for me. Now, this is very interesting. Um, the because of this Hashem did for me actually now um, the actually the uh, the Malbim has an interesting way he translates it different than we would translate it uh He says, um, but where is that? Because of this. Yeah. See, he says as follows. Um, um, so Robin and Leo reads it a little differently. We all read it is because of this because of this, the Hashem did for me when I left Egypt. That's how I wrote it up there. Rabbi Namliel would say it a little bit differently. This is because of what Hashem did for me when I left Egypt. Meaning that this, this is uh this is because of what Hashem did for me. He's going to try retranslate it like this. So the this what's the this? This. Or, or this is actually um, the Pesach, Matzah, and Morar is because of what? This is because of what Hashem did for me when I left Egypt. This being the Pesach, Matzah, Morar. The Pesach, Matzah, and Morar. This, these three items that we have here uh, on the table is because of what Hashem did for me. Because the reason why I have a sheep here on the table and the reason why I have matzah and moror is because what Hashem did for me when I left Egypt. Because when I left Egypt, he told me to have a sheep and eat matzah, right? And, and eat it on top of moror. So, the reason I have these three symbols here is because that's what Hashem did for me when I left Egypt. He had me have these three symbols. And therefore, I'm going to also have these three symbols. So he says, Roman Gamaliel is saying, it, it says, um, 
You mean the Malbim? Well, yeah. The Malbim says that what Rabbi Gamliel is saying okay. is, you know, the, the difference between the this is the subject. Uh, like they say, this is the subject of the subordinate clause, you know, not the object, not because of this, but this is because of what happened. So the object is what happened. And this is a symbol of what happened. The other way to read it is because of this, Hashem did for me when I left Egypt. It's then the object is <coughs> they become the object. And he's saying, no, that's not what Rabbi Gamliel is saying. saying. That's not what Rabbi Gamliel is saying. Rabbi Gamliel is saying that the exodus from Egypt is the object. And because of that object, I end up with Pesach, Bats, and Mora. The first way to say it is, it's like Hashem did this so that I could be eating Pesach, Bats, and Mora. Like the goal is the Pesach, Bats, and Mora. That's the common way of translating it. That, that you know why Hashem took us out of Egypt? Because he wanted us to be eating Pesach, Matz, and Mora one night a year. And the goal is the Pesach, Matz, and Mora. The Malvin's way of translating it is no. This is because of what happened. These are the symbols. The object is to know about the exodus from Egypt. And the reason I have these symbols is because of what Hashem did for me. So I'm doing this because of the object. The whole goal was to get us out of Egypt. And these symbols help us remember that goal of getting out of Egypt. Not that Hashem did this so that someday I could be eating matzah. The way it generally reads is, you know, Hashem took us out of Egypt so that, so that tonight we could be eating matzah. Well, that's not why he took, according to him, that's not why he took us out of Egypt. He took us out of Egypt. He wanted us out of Egypt. I'm eating matzah because I remember so I should remember the matzah is subordinate to the exodus of Egypt, yeah, right. not that the exodus of Egypt is, you know. Okay. Right. Now, but the bottom yeah. line is, the bottom line is um, that the that the this, which is everyone agrees is the pace of Matz and Moron, shows up at this point in the progression. And that's where it shows up in our Haggadah at this point in the progression. Okay. Which leads us to the next section. Hashem did for me. What does that mean? Behold Abedar. Behold Abedar. It's obvious, right? In every generation. I have to, and this whole thing is very much me, not them. It's not about them. It's about me. Bottom of page 44. For me, but um, bottom of page 44. Okay, and that's what Shem did for me. You have to view yourself as though you personally left Egypt. And what do we do? He goes back to swing around again, this time. Saying, where do I get that from? Again, our source pasuk. This time, of course, the focus is on the li. Hashem also li, it's a C, maybe it's right, when he took me out of Egypt, not our fathers, right? Not, not <laughs> our fathers, but even us too. And another pasuk, Shenemar, Bosano Hotsi Misham, us did God take from there to bring us to the land. That he swore to our fathers. Okay, so what's left? That say see me mitzrayim. That say see me mitzrayim. So you turn to the next page, and what do you got? Hallel. What's the middle paragraph of the hallel? It says he's from him is right. It says he means right when I left Egypt. It all wraps up. It all wraps up with us singing about how I left Egypt. It says he's from him is right, but that's the hollow, right? And the, the top paragraph on the page tells us that what the goal is. Therefore, 
and that the chayavim we are obligated. Top of page forty six. Therefore, we're obligated to praise, praise, law, tribute, all this you know, different words for for everything that God did for our fathers and for us. He took us from slavery to freedom, right? And therefore, we have to say, we have to praise. And what do we praise? We oh. praise. But say, but say, we sing Hallel to Hashem and we praise Hashem. So that is page 46. And that's the whole deal. In order. Everything following exactly in order. Why? Because that's what the Pesach said. Right? Can't get smarter than the Torah. <laughs> if that's the way the Torah chose to do it, they tell us to do it, we do it. Makes all of the essential points that are found in our source. We've, we've, we've checked off each box going all the way through. We did the mitzvah, therefore. We presume if this is what Hashem said to do, and I did, and I made sure to catch every point, I've done every point, and I have to do the mitzvah. Now, you know, all the way at the end, we are going to say, because, you know, we don't know if we did it so well, but at the end of the at the end of the meal, you know, when we get all the way to the end, and then we say, Chasal Seder Pesa. We say <clears throat> that we hope we hope that we did it all, all correctly. Right? So, um, you know, that's our prayer at the end that, uh, you know, we, we hope and pray that we we're able to do this appropriately as Hashem. Okay. Now, at this point, we're going to, uh, before we, uh, before we, uh, at this point, we have to, now that we've come to praise Hashem, now it's time for us to start to do the other mitzvahs, both Torah and rabbinical, which will be eating the matzah, because we did the to already. And, you know, notice that we do the Haggadah before we eat. <laughs> I think that you could have done either one first, but it would seem to me to be two reasons. Number one is, if you do it after you eat, then you can't say when the matzah and the mora are sitting in front of you because you already ate them up, right? But I think more practically, if you would do it after you eat, you'd never do it. <laughs> it wouldn't happen. <laughs> you start with the meal, know it. You know, the Haggadah has a hard enough time before the meal. If you try to do it after the meal, then stand a chance. But the first thing that we're going to pick up is with after the meal is we're going to say the halal. No. Why do we say half the halal before and half the halal afterwards? So the first part that we said before, if you take a look on page 46, uh, we praise Hashem, how he lifts us up. And then we talk about what was it like when they were leaving Egypt? Now the, you know, the sea fled and the mountains trembled and all that. But when we go to the other end of after the benching, when we're all done with the meal, we pick up again with the rest of Hallel, which is on page 64. So there, from at that point on, it's all in the future tense. It says, uh, um, Yisrael betach v'ashem, lo lano Hashem, lo lano ki l'shim chatein kavod. Give glory to your name. Uh, page 64. Uh, 
Give glory. That's future tense. Hashem Zichroni, Yevorich, bless our memory. Yevorich, Yireinam. You know, I love Hashem for He, Ki Yishma Hashem is calling. He will hear my voice. In other words, the Hagad, the Hallel, at this point, turns toward the future, future redemption. So it's not really appropriate. This part of the Hallel is not appropriate to the Betsesi Mimitsrai. When I left Egypt, when I left Egypt is recalling a past event, which is the mitzvah of the night to recall the past event. Now that the Seder is over and I've eaten my matzah, now it's time for me to turn ahead to start thinking about the future and the redemption and what's going to be and all that. That's not the fulfillment of the mitzvah of telling over the exodus of Egypt. And it's not the fulfillment of the mitzvah of matzah. Um, but we, which the mitzvah of matzah was done. Well, that's all question we'll get into, you know, when or how do we do the mitzvah of matzah particularly? But <clears throat> the uh, when is it done? It's done before the meal. Technically, I would have presumed that the afikomen should be the mitzvah of matzah. Mm -hmm. Because that's when they ate it in temple times at the end of the meal. The, the afikomen represents the lamb. It was eaten at the end of the meal because you're supposed to eat it on a full stomach. Yeah. You're not supposed to eat it when you're hungry because then it won't be noticeable that it's a mitzvah. Everyone thinks just dinner. So it has to be eaten on a full stomach. So the afikomen which is eaten at the end of the meal, really is the carbon Pesach. Okay, but are you saying in the times of the temple? Yeah. But the Shech, they, they, they did the, the carbon Pesach. Oh, yeah. So why would they need to remember the carbon Pesach with the Avicomen when they already just did? Well, they haven't eaten it yet. So they Shech did it, and there it is, sitting on the table, roasted, and we're eating a whole meal, and after we're full, eating from our korban chagiga offering, when we're all done, then we eat. Um, then we eat the. Um, so the korban pesach was an ola. It was completely burned. Nobody ate. It. No, no, it's a shlomim. Yeah. So, so but they ate. It. Yeah, at the end of the meal. <clears throat> so why would they need an apikoma if they just? No, no, our afikoman is to remember that at the end of the meal, they yeah, ate a carbon pesa. So that gets me confused, because I thought you meant that in the times of the temple, they ate the afikoman. Well, they did. They ate the Pesach. They ate the Pesach at the end of the meal. For us, we eat the afikoman to remember. I, I had you said Right. So technically, if anything, when we eat the afikoman, we are remembering we are remembering the eating of the carbon Pesach. Really, really, you would ask the question, we should make the bracha at the end before we eat the afikomen. Allah chilas matzah, because the, the, if the, if the, um, if the, uh, Pesach was eaten with matzah and morar, like Hillel did, then it would be like, you think it'd be at the end of the meal. So they say, yeah, it is, but you know, we had to eat matzah earlier when we started the meal. It'd be very strange to eat matzah and then make a bracha for eating matzah all the way at the end of the meal when we've been eating matzah already since the beginning of the meal. So we we'll make a bracha earlier. Right. But it is to remember the Korban Pesach. Now, in their times, they ate matzah to do the mitzvah of matzah. Um, they ate matzah. Let's see, how did they do it? That's interesting. I don't know how they did it. It's very curious to me. How did they do it? Because if they ate the matzah first, wasn't the matzah really the Korban Pesach, how can they eat matzah without eating the Korban Pesach? And if so, 
how do they eat on a full stomach? Because where do they have the meal from? Okay, I'm a little confused with that. We'll put that aside. Getting, I'm getting past myself. Not, not prepared to speak about that. So the bottom line here is for us, we have explained the layout <clears throat> of the pasuk to be the um, to be the uh, to be the uh, layout of the uh, to, of the Haggadah. The Haggadah follows the order of the Pasuk. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, now actually, yeah, let's just, uh, let's just stop at this point and, and maybe next time we'll get, so what we really have glossed over, which is the biggest part, I mean, we've done, we've done some really important explaining. But the part that we glossed over, which is the main part, the main act, is saying, which is actually the telling of the story, right? So how is that organized and all that? But uh, Mirza Chem will hopefully will pick up with that on Tuesday. Rosh Chodesh Nisan. I might have thought we could fulfill it from Rosh Chodesh Nisan, but no. no, no. <laughs> I might have thought. Okay, let's just grab a couple of minutes. We'll do a little uh, of those. Okay. That's on page 373. Does that sound good to me? Number three. Put all my things in. That wouldn't happen. I Okay, let's just get the top of page three seventy-two. Three seventy-two. Yeah, is that okay? Okay, okay. Uh, I got okay. Very good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, ah, uh, ha, So. Not surprisingly, there are five things that a person will need in order to have trust in Hashem. You have to have five factors to have trust in Hashem. Okay? That's the Chamesh Ekdamas. There are five uh, the prefaces in order to have trust in Hashem. Number one, Ekdam Rishon He. Shia Amin, a person has to believe uh, them, and it should be clear to him. That there are seven conditions to God. And these, that if those are found, if he has those five conditions, you can trust in him. And Ukvar his karti to Naim Ela Baperik Hakodam. I already mentioned those those seven. The Khakti Mipsukim Shanid is Damnuli, and I even proved him from verses, Shem Nim Saim et Solokim, Telahim. These are the seven things that that any being has to have in order to be trusted. That's an Ayarishim. That the one you're trusting in is more merciful to you than anyone else. Not only that, 
else you call Rachmanus Vechemla, she yesh lamishu shaladam. Any mercy or pity that anyone would have, he may have Rachamin Vechemla, she nasna kebaliba. If you ever see mercy or pity exhibited by anyone, that mercy and pity comes from God. As it says, God will find will give you mercy and you'll have mercy. Now, the <clears throat> the um the, this idea that when anyone is exhibiting mercy, it comes from Hashem. That's an amazing idea. Because why would someone exhibit mercy? You know, I mean, they like to show this in the uh, in these uh, Animal Channel videos. You know that, uh, like, you know, uh, the baboon takes care of the lion cub or something like that. You know, these like. Well, first of all, the reason they are uh, YouTube videos is because they're rare. Generally, the baboons don't take care of lion cubs. They maybe eat lion cubs, but they don't take care of lion cubs. You know, I don't know what, I don't know how that works, but they they generally don't do that. And generally, the animals, as we say, are instinctively they protect themselves. So, but where would a sense of mercy come from? Basically, everybody should be. A, a sociopath like every being everyone should be a sociopath like we all should be out for ourselves <clears throat> i try to take care of number one that's me i try to do what's in my my interest how is it that people care for other people they go away there for other people you know people see something you could you can you know hear about some cause or something like that and, uh, you know, you're moved. You feel a sense of pity. You want to care for other person. They put up a picture of a starving child. Everyone feels a sense. Of, where does that come from? How could that have evolved? You know, the bottom line is, we believe, it is a quality that Hashem put into each and every one of us. It's something that he put into us. And therefore, when you see it exhibited, it should remind you that it's a trait that Hashem has instilled in us. The Hashemi, the second one is, We trust in Hashem, or we trust in only creatures that have unlimited ability to come through. And that is, it's only logical, um, um, yeah, because God, man is one of the things God made. And who could care for us better than the one who made us? How he could fix us and how he could actually break us. They said, "Vayim pogin balara." What's going to be bad for us? Umahim gourmet machalos rufoso, and what causes his illness and his and his health? Umahim adover kach legabe dover shenas ali debenerim. And if that would be true, uh, for example, if you buy a Tesla, then you are probably um, well advised to go back to the Tesla people for operating instructions, right? You won't call up GM to find out how to work your Tesla. Yeah. You know, repair your Tesla. Yeah, I mean, you know, or, you know, you don't call up, you don't call up GM and ask them, if I do this, will it be okay or will it hurt my Tesla? You call up Tesla to find out if it'll, it'll you know, you call up GM to find out about GM. You don't call up a, a GM for Tesla and vice versa. And that is even with, you know, things that 
you know, actually other people probably could tell you how to work a Tesla besides Tesla, but still you call up Tesla. Now, Tesla didn't create Tesla. Tesla put together the various components in a way that they call that Tesla. They didn't create metal. They didn't create electricity, right? They didn't create even the batteries or the rubber or the tires. They didn't create anything. So therefore, Hashem, who literally created everything physical, he created my not only the, the construction of my body, he even created the materials that are used in the construction of my body. And the way my body is constructed, the pattern and everything like that, ex nihilo, from nothing, so certainly he'll know what's best and what hurts a person. And what is really going to be the best thing for a person in both this world and the next? I am Hashem. I teach you for your own benefit. I show you along the road. Whoever Hashem loves, he rebukes, like a father will rebuke a son. Okay, so bottom line is, Hashem can be trusted because, first of all, he is the source of all mercy. And second of all, who knows better for us what's good for us than he does? Okay, stop with that. Okay. Yes, thanks to the Malbim. All right. Send, Have a good Shabbat. Send him your uh, send him your best. Good Shabbos. Good Shabbos. Take care.